Thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the few of you who are still here listening to the presentation. Uh, and then it's very interesting, I mean, big or small, you know, so long as you are interested in the market, I try to deliver a presentation that is of interest to you as the best that I can. So uh, for today, I will just uh, talking about a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think many of you do not know well about uh, MySteel Global, so that's why I will start with that, but it's just 30 seconds, really very brief. And then we'll be talking about China's steel market dynamics and then followed by iron ore, and then uh, followed by China's iron ore market supply. Because whenever you're talking about iron ore, you know, everyone is familiar with Wally, Rio Tinto, BHP, FMG, but what about China? And then last of all, um, may not be a good news uh, to the mining projects because we're talking about scrap. So scrap is renewable ones. Uh, disclaimer. Um, so MySteel Global and MySteel Group. MySteel Group actually uh, is just a logo. So our company, um, the group company name is uh, Ganglian Holding. So it's a, a Shenzhen listed company headquartered in, Sh in, in Shanghai. We have over 3,000 employees in China. And uh, whereas we have all the um, steel market related indicators, 700,000. So it's about prices, inventories, capacity utilization, everything. And uh, Singapore, we set up the business in 2015. And starting with a brokerage service followed by um, market intelligence. So market intelligence, we're talking about data sharing as well as uh, the others, like what is happening in China, steel market, iron ore market, coal market as well, but more about cooking coal market. And uh, we have overseas employees, the majority of us in Singapore, we have a Singapore office, now we have 12 people. And we have Melbourne, we have the sales manager over there, we have uh, London, we have uh, um, Tokyo as well. So now we are going to talk about China's uh, steel industry dynamics. Uh, it's very interesting. I think everyone has been looking at China's steel output. It's pretty much amazing. Talking, we are talking about nine to eight million tons last year, which is over 50% of the global steel production. And if you're looking at the year-on-year -year growth, it's about 6.6%. But if you look looking at the quarter one, it's even more shocking. It's about 9.9%. 9 .9%. Latest number has it that the China steel output actually grow by 10% for the first four, four months. But this is problematic because uh, if you're looking at last year and this year, I don't know how much you, you guys know about the Chinese steel market, uh, but last year we have all this kind of winter restriction, basically just Beijing telling steel mills not to produce so much. But this year it had been more focusing on the sintering and coking. So it hurt um, some of the iron ore products, but not so much about the steel output. And the peak iron, um, I just want to highlight the number here. It's like you, are, you can see that peak iron actually catching up with the growth of the finished steel. It's an indicator telling you that blast furnaces have been operating as per normal. Otherwise, you wouldn't be having so much uh, hot metals coming up. And uh, the others, uh, when we talk about the iron ore imports, this is interesting because uh, China is the largest, again, largest uh, consumer of everything, basically. So iron ore, if they imported about 1.06 billion tons last year, but it is a year-on-year -year comparison, it's a minus. That is a turning point because we have been looking at uh, the, the first quarter as well. It's another decline, which means that China's iron ore consumption to some extent already peaked. But why it peaked last year? I think part of the reason is because uh, China put a lot more scrap into the converters as well as into the blast furnaces. So you can see that iron ore reliance on the imports has been declining, but it's still a very big, big number. I believe like for this year, you know, we are not so much away from this one billion tons. It may be a bit small decline because looking at the trend now, you can see it, it's happening, but it's still a kind of a huge reliance on the important, uh, on the important market. And the other thing is uh, China's iron ore output. Uh, this is just a run of mine. Looking at the number is pretty shocking. But if you're talking about the concentrates, means that the final products you, to the, you put into the blast furnace, it's not really so much. Um, it's about like 250 million tons. That's part of the, re okay, to put it this way, China's domestic supply of iron ore accounting for about 10, 15% market share, which means that you know, 85%, they're still really relying on uh, the imported iron ore. That's why everyone would like to talk about the global iron ore prices. But when you talk about the global iron ore prices, it's more about China CFR, CFR prices. 
The next one, um, I think it's more like kind of a summary of what happened in the past few years of China. China finished um, removing all the excess capacities. So in the past three years, um, during 2016 to 18, China removed 150 million tons. That is more or less, I think, near 1.5 times of uh, Japanese steel output because uh, good days or bad days, Japan produced about 90 to 100 million. So basically we remove, you know, one and a half um, Japan output out of the market. Another thing is that now um, China is only allowed for old for new swap. So you can only like reduce one and then add on one, uh, add one more, uh, one time onto the market which means that your capacity will be capped to some extent. There may be some minor, minor expansion, but it won't be huge. China tried to maintain the capacity at a certain level. Another thing is about environmental protection. To some extent, you are right, talking about ash and everything, but in China to China, um, emission including everything. So carbon emission is part of the deal as well. And uh, when we were talking about, of course, you know, those you can visible and invisible ones, um, China just deal with that at the same time. Because um, the other day, actually, um, last week, when I was talking about the coal market as well, um, we we're talking about the China shifting towards renewable energy as well. So coal, especially thermal coal, definitely is not really that welcome in the Chinese market anymore. Another thing is mergers acquisitions. So China's uh, steel mills will be growing and growing big. So now China got the second largest uh, steel mill in the world, which is Bao Group. It's so close to the ArcelorMittal as well. So if you're looking at China, you know, maybe in two years time, China will be having someone that is as big or even bigger than ArcelorMittal. That is happening in China. That's mergers acquisitions concentration. And then that will be easy for you to manage your steel market. Here are the capacity utilization. I just want to highlight here is that if you're looking at, looking at all this since uh, 2015, um, all the way, it's coming down a little bit, but in general, it has been producing quite well. We're talking about blast furnaces. It shows that you know, uh, since 2016, Chinese steel mills are making money. And then when you are making money, you try to maintain your capacity utilization high. So you maximize your output, you maximize your margins as well. Um, sintered fines into the blast furnaces uh, versus imported sintered fines. So in general, when China put the sintered fines into the blast furnace, there are two sources, as I mentioned, imported as well as, uh, as, well as the domestic supply. So in general, imported sintered fines is a majority, definitely the majority, 80% plus um, into, this, uh, um, into the blast furnaces. Here is uh, talking about the Tangshan billet prices uh, versus the complete production cost. Uh, why we are using billet? I think uh, especially for mature market, everyone looking at the HRC, you know, the flat steel, whereas China, because of the consumption model, is more about riba and, and billet as well. And billet is so close to the raw material. That's why we are using this, talking about the prices and the complete production cost. There will be a, a time that if you're looking at the margin actually maximized, that's when, when your supply is not sufficient and then everyone's still producing a lot for the finished steel, then all of a sudden you see the, uh, the, the billet prices shutting up, shooting up and then your margins really maximize. There was, I give a, um, people a number, uh, there was a time uh, for Chinese steel mills for each particular ton of uh, um, steel produced, they can generate as much as over 1,000 RMB margin. That is huge. It happened only during the really booming period before the financial crisis. And so that, that shows that for the past two years, the steel mills did really have a, a very strong revival. Here is about the uh, uh, here is uh, um, about the iron ore market. Um, I think from China's point of view, it's very uh, basic telling everyone is it's oversupplied. But if you're looking at okay mining, um, I think recently you know especially for this year, everyone talking about the valley and everyone is about the supply. But if you're talking about quantity wise, there is no worry. There will be more than enough. And then I want to highlight here is that. China steel mills are always very creative. If you, they have the premium quality that's very good at, afford, uh, at affordable prices, but if not, they can really blending everything and anything in the blast furnaces. Make sure the steel 
quality is still there and production costs are still affordable. So do not really, I, I would like to really, you know, whoever in the iron ore market do remind you that do not really underestimate China's creativity in the steel making. And uh, the valley thing, everyone talking too much about the supply, but if you're looking at the demand, as I mentioned, China's demand for imported iron ore is slowly coming down. That's uh, for sure. And brand-wise, I would say that, yeah, quantity-wise, there is oversupply. But if you look at different brands, there will be undersupply. Because China's environmental protection and everything, they are shifting towards a higher grade. And then because of the fines are still more affordable, a lot of Chinese steel mills having the sintering plants, having the palletizing plants, they will be focusing on the fines. But there was a time when I mentioned that the steel margins is about like 800 and above, they're shifting towards lumps. Pallet is always the last choice. Um, I think it's because of two reasons. One reason is the supply is rather limited. If you're talking about the, the major iron ore mining companies, they have been focusing in European market, Japan, Korea, for their, uh, for their uh, pallet supply. So China is always supplementary. It's always a market that is good to have, but it cannot, can, cannot really rely on heavily on China's supply uh, demand. Um, so, um, and then uh, different uh, offtake deals and focuses. This is part of the thing, whenever you go into the mining operations, you need to pay attention, like some steel mills will be purchasing long term, which means that whoever um, new, um, whoever invested in the iron ore uh, mining projects, if you want to explore the Chinese market, you will be having a bottleneck because the Chinese steel mills will not be so willing to shift towards new suppliers unless you can prove yourself. Uh, these are the parts. Uh, we're talking about the glo uh, global iron ore market supply. So here is just uh, try to highlight what will be happening. All the companies are uh, cutting their um, guidelines for this year um, because of like Australia got a cyclone and the Valley got the project, uh, the, the accident. So no one knows. Um, I think the cyclone is more about the seasonal factor, whereas Valley, for the time being, they don't know what will be happening with their um, suspensions. So it's a kind of a big question mark. Um, but Valley, majority of their supplies are definitely higher grade ones uh, than the Australian ones. So, you know, if China strengthening the control of the pollution, which means that in the premiums uh, of the higher grade ones are against the, the, the norm of the medium, medium grade ones from Australia, you will see a kind of a huge jump of the premium. It happened last year already. There was a time the premium of 65 against 62 is about like $30, $40. Now we are at like kind of $15, half of that pr premium. But the premium is always, you know, jump up and down according to your market situation. This is uh, um, the, the prices, so Australian and Brazilian, you can tell that Brazilian, um, the, the number, is, uh, the green line is always above. It's always a premium, but the premium will be, as I mentioned, you know, it will be uh, shrinking or kind of expanding depending on the market situation. This is about China's. So if you're looking at China's, uh, here actually I have it. Uh, it's about the import by months. Looking at the import by months, it's pretty much stable, but in the, it kind of slowly going up a little bit, but it will be coming down a little bit as well. It shows that the country's demand, you know, is kind of moving not so much, month by month, but in general, I think I have another page. If you're looking, oh, sorry, I don't have it, unfortunately. Uh, if you have, looking at the months, it doesn't really change so much. But uh, if you're looking at it on a yearly basis, it will be just like going up and then coming down. So as I mentioned, it's kind of a decline already, for, uh, already seen last year. This is China's uh, own uh, output. You can see that, you know, sometime in uh, 2015, it peaked and then coming down. It's because that during that time, a lot of the mining companies trying to hold in well, um, you know, trying to just hang in there. I'm not really, um, I don't think it's kind of holding well. Just hanging there for a couple of years and then they surrendered. They realized that they couldn't really go on anymore. So a lot of the small size mines shut down because uh, they have been making losses for quite, a, quite some years. But why you can still see, uh, you know, after the, it's come, um, come to stabilize is because nowadays a lot of mining companies, either is 
they're not so much, strictly speaking, independent iron ore mining company, companies. In China, a lot of mining companies are affiliated to the steel mills. So they have the obligations to produce and supply to their steel plants. That's why you can see the stabilization. And uh, here, as here, as I mentioned, uh, in, the, in the, the, the other one, is talking about the year. So that's why uh, two, 2014, 2015, it peaked and then coming down. There's, that was because uh, some of the smaller mines have been washed out of the market. China's mining investment. I think uh, this will be more relevant to everyone here. And then I'm not only talking about the ferrous, non ferrous as well. After being hit by the financial crisis, which came late, in China, um, everyone is talking about 2008 for the global market, but in China actually it happened 2012 because China got the four trillion. So the four trillion yuan stimulus package cushioned China over for another like three, four years, but afterwards China still felt the heat and the heat came in 2012. Everyone was making losses and then the steel industry going to the bottom, actually hit the bottom 2015. Then, a actually coming up in 2016. But normally, I believe like for mining investors, unless you are sure you're going to make money, you wouldn't be rushed into any action. So same with China's mining uh, investment. It's only recently, talking about uh, 2018, uh, you can see some of the investment going into coal mining and processing, and um, surprisingly, and now surprisingly, ferrous mining and processing as well. And um, because uh, China put the mining and the processing, so the money more into the processing. Uh, Versus of a coal is more about the mining because China shifting the coal mining from poor resources areas to rich resources areas. So that you will be see uh, some of the um, investment going into that particular area. Whereas for ferrous mining and processing is more about the processing and the concentrating. Not so much about a lot of the new mining projects coming along. Um, it's more about like more co concentrated capacities and putting in to make it bigger. Part of the reason is because of the poor grade in the reserves. So you need to processing more and making sure your processing and concentrating capacity is more efficient. This is about iron ore inventories. So, um, I would say that now is not a time to put more iron ore um, into China yet because China's iron ore port, um, China's coastal ports are sitting with very heavy industries. And uh, even recently, we can see that the tonnage dropped, but it's still we're talking about 134 million tons, which will be tiding over the, 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 the industry for quite a while. And then, um, so now uh, definitely China rely on the, the domestic supplies, port inventories, and seabound cargoes, depending on which is more affordable and reasonable. Um, and uh, this is about by region. So when you are looking at all the, um, the numbers and everything, we're talking about the, the total number, and followed by the majority actually is Australian. Uh, Brazilian having some, but not so much. As I mentioned, Brazilian is ha more higher grade, and also like um, the appetite from China will be rather limited. So majority is still about the medium, which anything about um, from all the 58 to 62 and 63, and anything above will be considered um, as higher grade. Scrap. I think the scrap will be maybe a bad news for all the mining projects because China trying to shift the iron ore uh, steel making model to scrap shipping uh, model. But the good news is that the scrap will not be coming along very soon because the scrap is uh, still a very, um, it's at the, at the infant stage. Um, China doesn't have a mar many uh, sizable recycle yard at all. And then uh, you don't have that much uh, renewable energy as well. China trying to uh, curtail this uh, coal-generated power consumption inside the country. And that's why when, whenever you don't have the renewable energy coming online, you can't really promoting heavily about the EAF. Because you may have the first fund finances, but you realize you don't have enough power supply to support. But in the long run, in the next five, 10 years, China's scrap supply definitely will be growing. Um, so I would say that you know, for the next five to 10 years, that the iron ore supply as well as the import volumes may see further declines year by year. Yeah, um, that's just about my presentation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Hongmei. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? 
<clears throat> thank you. It was really good. Um, just one question on uh, scrap usage in BO apps, right? Uh, how much higher do you think it can replace hot hot metal usage in BO apps further? Uh, let's say in the short term, next two three years. And do you think uh, there would be enough scrap supply in the next two three years for both the EAF as well as a slight more increase in BO apps usage? Last year, China generated 220 million tons of scrap, and then uh, 180, ton 180 million tons went into steel making. And then uh, in the coming years, uh, I think we, we had a number, do we? Uh, no, we don't. Okay, that is another presentation, <laughs> sorry. Um, so by 2030, China's uh, scrap supply will be 300 million, and 2050 will be 400 million. So definitely it's ongoing, and then it will be increasing year by year. Uh, the problem, actually, I would say that the key issue, depending on how much effort the government wants to promote this, because all this kind of, whenever you have an industry in the infant stage, the government, whether it's preferential policy, whether it's funding, is very crucial. Uh, for the time being, the government is very busy with all the other stuff. So we are close to the 13th five-year planning period, which will be 2020. And afterwards, you know, China stopped talking about many, um, China manufacturing um, 2025, right? But China will be going to the next stage. And that's when China will be more promoting eco-friendly steel capacities. And to answer your question, so, you know, it will be, you know, if China want more scrap supply, it can be happening. Because the government wants it happen, it will be happening. Uh, for the time being, blast furnace steel mills are putting um, some. Of, you'll be surprised. Some of them actually putting like as much as thirty-five scrap into the blast furnace, not converters, putting into the blast furnace. But the scrap actually generated inside the house, so you can guarantee the quality and everything. It's not so much about how much you can put in; it's more like whether economical to put in. Because the more you put in, actually, the, your production cost rising. And uh, for converters, for the time, it's about 20%. And it can be further increasing. Uh, again, at the end of the day, it's whether it um, makes sense for you to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you. Question back. Thanks. So very interesting. There's been a lot of talk about um, the increasing use of vanadium into the steel industry. Could you comment on that? When it actually happened, uh, it's because of uh, China um, changed the quality standard for the rebar, basically. It's because of construction steel. I think this is kind of a long story, because that um, we have earthquakes, and then you realize that the building actually cannot really stand the earthquake. And then you realize that it's because your construction material have problems. And China shut down all the induction furnaces back in 2017. Those induction furnaces are actually producing a lot of sub-quality rebars. And once you have all this noise removed from the market, then you can just say, I'm going to standardize my rebar quality and I want to increase it. I talked to a steel mill uh, in March when I was in China attending a conference. He wouldn't give me very specific numbers about how much vanadium you need to put into a steel. But he mentioned that because of the government changing the standard, um, their production cost increasing by about 200 RMB. Um, the idea behind is more like kind of uh, to make sure that your rebar can withstand an earthquake. Yeah, because China property normally you can own up to 70, 70 years. Yeah. Mm. Any further questions? One question I just, just, just came to me, and I may be completely wrong on this. So they might be going to be using aluminium or some sort of uh, other sort of substance. But Given that China is, is looking to become the world leader in the development of e-vehicles mm. um, and previously had quite a small automobile manufacturing industry and now that's possibly going to go to be one of the largest in the world, what impact is that possibly going to have on steel demand in China? I think, uh, unfortunately, I miss out the battery material. <laughs> So China definitely is uh, growing this uh, auto industry. Okay. I don't mean I don't mean about the battery materials. Yeah. I mean about actually making the frame. The steel, of the right? Car, the steel that goes into. Okay. The it's to some extent, it's a tr it's an opportunity and a threat as well, because with the new energy vehicles, you want your vehicles light, right? And then uh, some of the parts, the bodies, it should be replaced by aluminum alloy instead of steel. But unfortunately, China doesn't really have so much size. Okay. For Al aluminum alloy is not so much about uh, abundance or supply, it's more about cost. 
you can't really afford. Because China, you'll be surprised, in the auto industry, China's yearly sales volume, we're talking about 28 million ton, uh, units. 28 mi million, um, 28 million units, and then the car is so affordable that if you put expensive material, you can't really afford it. And then for the new uh, energy vehicles, nowadays got the government subsidy as well. So basically, your Tesla, Tesla trying to build a very big plant in Shanghai, but I check out their prices. It's about uh, last time I asked them, it's about seven hundred fifty thousand RMB. Whereas you know you can you can imagine China produce ones. We're talking about like maybe three hundred thousand. So you can't really afford the premium quality stuff into auto industry for the time being. Not so much. You know the steel mills are pretty happy. But then again, whoever produces in auto steel, they are pretty much the leaders already in the China industry. Like we have uh, um, Valing. Valing actually has um, has a joint venture, uh, auto uh, steel joint venture with uh, ArcelorMittal. And then Baowu actually has uh, one auto steel joint venture with Nippon Steel. So and um, Anshine Steel has one with Pulsco. So uh, the auto steel supply to some extent is already high end. For the time being, they can hold themselves very well. There's no placement yet so ever. Mm. Interesting. Any final questions before we wrap things up? Uh, if not, uh, please do grab Hong Mei afterwards and ask her any questions you like. But uh, thank you very much, Hong Mei Lee.